we'll just get started right away with uh, Holger Becker. Um, we at uh, Bartitz mainly know him as the CSO of uh, Microfluidic Chip Shop, one of our partners. We will hear more about them later in the demo. But as of October 2021, he's also a member of the German Bundestag. So congratulations. And um, you're taking a look into the crystal ball. So yeah, we're excited to hear from you. And everyone, remember to ask any questions you have in the chat. We are happy to answer them afterwards. Yes, thank you very much for having me here. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Good. All right. So um, actually, yeah, looking into the crystal ball is actually partly a look back in time and maybe a little bit on, on lessons learned. I will basically have three main topics I will going to talk about because indeed Microx has really been around now for quite a long time. And uh, if we look back into the history, you know, this was sort of the seminal paper from Andreas Manns, which basically kicked off this whole field we're now working with. And that's now 32 years ago. And uh, remember, uh, 32 years ago, Madonna basically had her first Greatest Hits album out. So that gives you some kind of cultural perspective of microfluidics. Um, and it's interesting to see what has really happened in that time. So how has the technology and the market perception has changed over the years? That will be the first part of my talk. Um, and obviously, I will also look into the situation. You know, has COVID-19, has the pandemic somehow helped the micro industry or has that had an impact on, on, the, on the markets? And then, of course, indeed, the third part, very briefly, uh, will, of course, have to do with my new role as a member of parliament. Uh, where I try to somehow discuss the, the way how we identify and fund R&D, because I think micro, despite its age, is of course still a, an R&D heavy field. And I think it's definitely worth uh, to spend some thought on how do we, let's say, improve the way how we do R&D. So if we look into um, especially the commercial micro devices, um, and I think most of the, the members here in the audience will probably come from industry. Um, we'll have to see, you know, what, what are the typical criteria we would like to see in a commercially successful microchip device. Uh, what we definitely see over the years is the complexity of the devices has significantly increased. If, if you look, you know, into the historic images of microchip devices, you know, the very first capillary electrophoresis devices, they were basically like this, just two crossing channels. If you look what is on the market right now, it definitely looks different. Micro cartridges nowadays are really complex, almost integrated microfluidic circuits, uh, which ideally from a user's perspective contain a com complete essay a complete workflow say in, in the analytical sciences or in, 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 in synthesis, um, which can be uh, labeled under this, you know, sample in answer out or sample in result out. Um, that goes hand in hand with the trend we see that instrumentation should become simpler, easier, ideally more portable. <clears throat> of course, everybody has this idea of just basically having a smartphone powered uh, microfluidics, analytics, diagnostics, or at least something which has the form factor of, the, of a smartphone like thing. Um, something I, of course, coming from a manufacturing company, uh, would like to elucidate a lot is we would like to see robustness in manufacturing when we start to scale up production. Um, ease of use goes hand in hand with this you know, sample in um, result out concept. And the last point, and that's something I will come back a couple of times during my talk, is that these devices have to be cost effective. I, 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 I try to call it like that. I, I try to avoid the, the, the word cheap or low cost, because we indeed will see that in quite a few applications, 
we will not have this you know, magic $1 device. Um, if we look into what is published in, um, in the scientific papers, however, we very often see something like this. And that's actually pretty interesting that um, if you would show somebody from academia who has worked in the 90s in microx this image, they would immediately identify that, yeah, this, of course, is, is a microwave device. If we look, however, into what is available on the commercial scale, and I just picked this uh, from AGL, this uh, cartridge and, and, and reader, it would not be so obvious, at least in the first glance, that this is, of course, um, a cartridge device which is based on microfluidics. So clearly, um, the, the commercial world in microfluidics has changed significantly more than the academic world. And the big challenge, of course, always is, you know, how, how do we do the translation going from the, the right-hand side, uh, from the left-hand side of this image to the right-hand side? And that's pretty challenging, actually. And it, it really exemplifies the difference between the academic research um, and an industrial product development, which I think has shown to be a big hurdle in commercialization. And as I mentioned before, I think the commercial side has changed significantly more in, in many dimensions um, than the academic world. And you know, if we look at you know, what's the difference of what is out there in the commercial world versus uh, what you can see in, in, in published papers. It, of course, has to do a lot with basic materials. People who know me know I'm, I, I used to bash PDMS. Um, we also see that the degree of integration in the commercial devices tend to be significantly higher than what is shown in most academic work. Um, we see that uh, commercial devices very often consist out of, because of this integration thing, uh, heterogeneous materials um, and requires hybrid and heterogeneous integration. It covers complex assembly processes, um, which are actually the big cost drivers. Um, and because of all that integration, it has to deal with questions, you know, how do I integrate valves or other active components? How, how do I integrate reagents? Which are typically not so much focused, especially the, the, the latter point, uh, tends to be not so, let's say, academically sexy, but it's an important aspect of commercial microfluidics. Question, of course, is, you know, how industrially re relevant are all these uh, considerations? And that, I think, is one of the biggest trends and, on the other hand, also biggest achievements in microfluidics that, of course, it has a, a huge industrial relevance. If you look into, you know, every year, you have this sort of towards the end of the year, you have this sort of top 10 innovations and so on. And you will find that in recent years, typically um, somewhere around seven out of 10 top life science innovations are based on microfluid devices. However, and that is really, that's a difference in the perception. That's why I, I would like to talk a little bit about the perception of microfluidics is that um, these companies will not go around and sell their devices as, you know, like Intel inside with, you know, microfluidics inside. It's not really specifically sold as a microfluidic system or device. It is a system which does next generation sequencing or which does sample prep or which uh, does automated CRISPR CAS or whatever. And I think that is something which is indeed a very different perception of microfluidics than it was 20 years ago or in the early years when we all thought that microfluidics itself is a product. It's not. It's an enabling technology which finds its way in many products um, and nowadays, as I said, is a cru crucial enabling technology for the life sciences industry or for diagnostics, but it's not really an industry and not a product in itself, at least in most cases. Um, there's also something which I would like to point out when we talk about where is the industry going. I think there is a noticeable geographic difference in the role of the players 
along the value chain. Um, in Europe, I think we're really strong in, in basic research. And if we look at the European framework programs, that's indeed something which the rest of the world, it's the envy of the rest of the world. Uh, we're also strong in, in things of basic material sciences, material research. On the industry side, we're really strong in components. You know, and of course, you know, with, with Bartels and Mimetis and the other players which are in this forum today, we see some very, very good examples of strong players on the component side. And of course, on manufacturing. Um, precision manufacturing simply has a, a very long tradition in Europe. However, where we're not so good and what, what the strong point, especially in the US, and I, 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 I leave Asia out of the, uh, this field here because I think the, the, the Asian markets are, are much more uh, closed, is of course um, that they are really strong in, in bringing systems slash applications to the market. And um, that's something um, where, of course, the money is being made. So the, for me, the big question is, and that's the question into the, the, the European micro community, can we somehow get better at that latter point? I would really like to see an evolution in Europe where we're becoming stronger on the application side, on the system side, and really in, in the process of opening new markets. That's something I think where we, where we have to get better in Europe based on the very strong foundation which we have on the materials components and, on, on, and manufacturing side. Let's have a look at um, the, the, the role of the pandemic in the perception of microfluidics. Clearly the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has pushed diagnostic testing into the limelight and I've just picked a few quotes from various sources in the early days of the pandemic where people always said, you know, testing is, is for sure a good way uh, to at least somehow control um, the, the pandemic. And it basically has um, had um, a catalytic effect on the development of point of care tests. It also, of course, has exposed the limitations of the existing methods if we look at PCR, lab-based PCR tests, which tend to be slow, expensive, and are throughput limited. Um, and of course, I think we all have been by now tested dozens or hundreds of times when we look into uh, um, antigen tests, which of course have a limitation with regard to sensitivity. Uh, so we create a, a fair amount of false negatives. And actually something which I'm pretty surprised at the moment is that there is so little um, antibody testing. We, I mean, by now we, we should have we should have much more data on the antibody status on the immunity status in the population, which we see unfortunately not so much. Um, and what is really interesting, of course, is it really has pushed point of care testing to totally unprecedented volumes. I mean, currently more than six billion tests have been performed with regards to COVID testing globally. I mean, that's a number which is just, uh, yeah, the only, the only other test which you could compare this to would be a simple glucose testing. That's the same uh, number, but over a much, much longer period in time. What are the lessons learned, I think, from the pandemic? The first one is uh, that, unfortunately, there is not the sort of single magic silver bullet where, you know, this, you know, this one thing solves all testing requirements. Uh, we for sure see that point of care testing will get a lasting boost in some countries more than in others. Um, and of course, clearly, uh, micro plays a decisive role in certain areas of testing, especially in the molecular diagnostic one. And I've picked two examples here. But what is interesting to see, of course, is if you look what has been rolled out and what has really kept the, the biggest share of this, you know, 6 billion tests is simple lateral flow testing. And I think that is something which, you know, now two and a half years into the pandemic, a lot of the hopes we had for a much wider rollout of a point of care molecular testing has not really materialized. Um, then, of course, 
what we find uh, as being important that there are platforms available as important tools to speed up development and ideally to combine test methodologies. So to have say a, a molecular test and say an antigen or antibody test on the same platform. And I mean, what we've been praying, <laughs> sort of praying for years at, at Microchip Shop is of course the availability of having building blocks and having a toolbox approach. Um, what we also have seen, but interestingly not at least at the, at the moment on, on a, with, with a huge commercial success is that there are additional technologies in point of care testing which without the pandemic probably would have stayed only in the academic field. So things like direct imaging methods, maybe in combination with uh, artificial intelligence, um, CRISPR methods, uh, silicon-based sensors, silicon photonic sensor devices, which have been, had been around for quite some time on the academic field, but have been sort of pushed into the commercial scale. Um, we also have seen that while Microx uh, can also improve the performance of simple lateral flow tests uh, by concentration, um, by amplification, um, that has not really made its way into an, let's say a, a noticeable commercial advantage, meaning people are were obviously not willing to pay that extra money for this sort of Microx uh, functionality. Uh, just an example here for one of these direct imaging methods. That's a simple cartridge <clears throat> which allows you by smart imaging processing methods to really directly count fluorescently labeled viruses on the surface of infected cells. And the second example I just briefly wanted to show is a device which contains a, a silicon photonic sensor that was actually already published a couple of years ago, um, but was a purely academic exercise. But we now see a, an increased commercial interest in this kind of uh, sensor integration. So um, if we look at uh, this part of the talk in conclusion, def point of care is definitely here to stay and we will see an increasing demand. I'm sure that uh, we will see that in, in Joel's talk uh, later on. It will become an important tool in handling pandemics. However, I think the high hopes we had in pushing the Microx market onto really new levels is probably not so pronounced as, as we all had hoped for. And as I said, I think we will see more of these data from, from you all um, in, in, in the coming talks. I think there is a certain impact of COVID-19 here in this column. And I would really love to see if these numbers in hindsight really have, have proven to be that way. Um, but as I said, it's not suddenly a, a, a trebling or so of the market volume. So some food for thought with regards to, um, uh, to this point of care testing uh, in pandemic situations. Um, what we definitely have seen is that the actual technologies, the way, I mean, we, we all already knew how these tests should look like before the pandemic. So technologies tend not to be the challenge, but of course, manufacturing, the distribution, the end user logistics, even if we talk about, you know, molecular diagnostic uh, point of care testing, and indeed the last one, cost. This has really been, uh, despite the sort of crazy situations where governments have paid silly amounts of money for masks or so in the early stages of the pandemic, now towards the end, it was, yeah, the, the health system simply bought the cheapest solution. The next question, and this is something which indeed also has not materialized, despite the fact that um, especially the US government has poured a huge amount of money in, during, through the RedX uh, program into manufacturing and upscaling of testing is, you know, what would you actually do with a manufacturing infrastructure which can produce you know, millions of tests per day once we're through this pandemic situation and the pandemic is more or less over? What, what do you do with that infrastructure? Who pays for this? And especially even if you don't use it, it's still costing money for maintenance. So in my opinion, this will require a much better international cooperation and coordination. Um, and the question would be, you know, who would be the, who would be stakeholders, who would be key players to do that? And uh, as I said, we will, at least I have not seen the, the, 
the perfect $1 point of care test using microwave devices, especially not in the, molecular, uh, in the molecular diagnostic field. And we indeed have now seen that price still is the most single important crucial factor for health systems. And that's why still all the testing centers are still using lateral flow immunoassays. Okay, in the last couple of minutes of my talk, I would like to just give you a few thoughts on R&D funding because yeah, MicroRigs is still R&D heavy. And if you look at the process of, you know, how does public or private R&D funding work, that actually has not changed significantly in the last hundred years. You define a research topic, you make a call for proposals, you get proposals, you try to evaluate them, and then some people get money. I have the, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis, that this process is basically at the end of its life cycle. Organizational processes, I think, have um, as a product, as a smartphone or whatever, have life cycles. And this is sort of typical stages of the life cycles. You know, you have a startup, you have a growth, you have a maturity, and then it's declining. And there are some symptoms which indicate for me that the current process of R&D funding is at the end of its life cycle. Everybody complains it's far too bureaucratic in writing the proposals in the evaluation and especially of course during the the run of a project and in the later uh, evaluation of that project a lot of bureaucracy involved um, it's also extremely inefficient if you look at some of the horizon 2020 programs we uh, some of the especially the life science programs the calls had acceptance acceptance rates of some like three percent which basically means you throw away 97% of the proposals of all the work which goes into these proposals. You throw away 97% of the work in organizing this whole process, and you throw away 97% um, of the review um, work which goes into that. So it's it's really it's an extremely inefficient process. Um, what we also see is that the funding in R&D is extremely fragmented. I mean, we have programs on the local scale, on the state scale, on the national scale, on the European scale, uh, and not just one program on each level, but yeah, dozens or hundreds of them. So it's a very, very fragmented world. And what we have seen, and that for me is really one of the most crucial phenomenon or symptoms which indicate that I think we have to do something there, is over the last 10 years, we've really been a spawning of an ecosystem of you know, consulting organizations which tell people, you know, oh, we, we write these proposals for you. This is actually really bad for the innovation process on two levels. First of all, uh, you only generate, uh, or let's say it's only already pretty um, financially well-off organizations can afford these uh, con uh, consultants. So, it's uh, you get a gap between the well-off organizations and the not so well-off organizations. And what is more crucial with regards to the thought of innovation, you will only get mainstream proposals because all these uh, organizations look at the text of the, of the call and they will pick the right buzzwords and put them into the proposal. But in the end, you get a, a massive bias towards mainstream um, R&D, which of course is not innovation friendly. If you really have a crazy idea, um, you almost have zero chance to get funding in that existing process. So uh, yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. We need a new process and I think we need, it has to be disruptive. This innovation, the process innovation has to be disruptive. It's like um, with, with the, the fuel engine, um, it's, it is optimized. You can't optimize it any further. You can't just modify a few things and then th things will become better, it's, it's out-optimized to a certain extent. And we will need a disruptive innovation in R&D funding processes, uh, like we have the disruptive innovation of um, battery-driven electric vehicles uh, these days. So we definitely have to find novel processes, which are less bureaucratic, all the way from application to reporting. Um, definitely are much more efficient, not wasting you know, more than 90% of the work which goes into that process. Um, we also need uh, a, a better alignment of national and international programs. I, I just always uh, like to mention Eurostars as an example that you know you get that Eurostar label and you have let's say three, four partners. 
two of them get their national funding immediately. Uh, one of them gets the national funding halfway through the program and one of the partners does not get national funding. So it's not very, it's not a very good model. We also need a, a different model for, for how to handle intellectual property in the sense that I think we need better incentives to exploit the results, which basically means the transfer from IP from the yeah, from universities or research organizations into the actual uh, typically companies or startups or whatever who exploit these results has to be made different. So the idea is probably to have, let them have IP because IP is actually worthless unless it's part of a commercial product, which then starts to generate revenue. And that's the time for some payback, but not something like upfront or so. Um, and overall, I think we need better, better methods for transferring scientific results into a commercialization process, into a commercialization pipeline. Uh, and that loops me back to this uh, comparison between the strong points in Europe versus the strong points in the US. I think that this would help us to also become better in really uh, commercializing applications and systems and not just components. Okay, my last slide, more or less, it's, uh, this just shows my new role in scientific and research community. I, I can tell you, it's a very, very, very different world than what I've been doing the last 25 years ago. So with this, I'm at the end, and of course, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Becker. That was a great way to start off our event. Thank you very much. So uh, I've already seen one question in the chat for you. Um, now that we are part, uh, now that you are part of the Bundestag, uh, do you think the R and D funding process? Uh, do you think the R and D? Sorry. Uh, do you think the R&D funding process can be improved away from the mainstream research? Yeah, I mean, that's, of course, exactly my job. I mean, um, now being part of a legislative body, um, I, of course, try to change that. I mean, it's interesting to see that, so, you know, the, the young parliamentarians, of course, they go into parliament saying, I want to make the world a better place. Um, I think if I succeed in sort of, you know, making... Uh, R&D funding more efficient and better for everyone involved, I have, uh, I, that would be my mission. So, and of course, yes, that's the discussion we're leading at the moment in, in, in a lot of different levels. I am at the moment talking to all the project takers. I talk a lot with uh, people from BMBF and the various uh, uh, non-university research organizations uh, to come up with a good way uh, to structure, uh, yeah, to basically, introduce new processes in at least the national R&D funding. Mm. We also had a comment before that, uh, totally agree, R&D thoughts, one could almost say that the system has been become corrupted. I wouldn't call it corrupted. I think it's really, it's, it's, it's the, the national, uh, it's, it's the natural end of the life cycle. I mean, the fact that um, you know, we live in a pretty wealthy society. We live in a society which has, you know, pretty well working public administration, which, you know, is Rechtsstaat, is based on legal foundations. That tells you that the, the processes we had set up 30, 50, 70 years ago, at that point in time, were pretty good. And they all work in the course of time, work well. But then eventually they reach that sort of saturation point uh, where you can't improve them anymore. Even if you try to sort of somehow introduce reforms, you're just adding layers of complexity and make them more, more bureaucratic. I wouldn't call it corrupt, but I think it's, it's, it's really just that natural end of life cycle when you need innovation in organizations, in processes. Mm -hmm. And one more comment uh, from Henne. I fully agree with Holger, funded projects seldom uh, lead to the results the applications promise. Not only consultants profit from the system, also many companies who don't need that. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, of course, it's always a, a, a question indeed. Where do you direct uh, research money into? And I just had a big discussion this morning um, with... Uh, uh, ZVEE, this is the, the, the how to say that, the 
the organization for the uh, electronics industry in Germany. Uh, because of course, as you might have seen, there are large pro uh, there's a, um, a large push on European level for uh, technological sovereignty in the microelectronics world. There's the European Chips Act, and a lot of money will indeed go into uh, the semiconductor field. Uh, if you look who is who are the players in that field, of course, these are all big multinational organizations. And I mean, Intel is uh, investing 17 billion for, for a chip factory in Magdeburg in Germany. But on the other hand, of course, they receive billions in public funding. And indeed, the question is, you know, um, is that money well spent? And it's difficult because, of course, these uh, large corporations, they basically said, you know, we we will pick one place in Europe to set up a fab. Um, and we basically go there where the conditions are best, whatever that means. Of course, it means space, but it also means, you know, where we get the biggest tax uh, incentives or um, uh, subsidies. So that process indeed is a challenge to define, you know, which fields and which companies should, uh, should get some kind of, uh, of funding and subsidies. It's a, a real strategic question we have, especially here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And one last question, and then we'll head over to the next speaker. What do you suggest academia should do to develop microfluidic systems closer to solutions to be large scale produced? <laughs> Hello, Vanya. Thanks for your question. Um, I think it would be worth to not think so much along technology lines, but to think about what problem would you like to solve? I think that would be the first thing. Um, and we actually see that both on the European level, but also in the national research that we now try to define research along so-called missions. We, would, we, we try to define outcomes. We try to define targets of what would what problems would we like to have solved by research? And that way we, we move away a little bit more from a sort of technocentric uh, approach towards a problem solving approach. And I think that that automatically will hopefully lead you uh, towards a route which will make it easier to later on um, explore commercialization routes. And of course, yeah, as you all know, I also don't use PDMS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that, thank you very much, Olga Becker. Yeah, thank you're you welcome. Again. And I more or less immediately have to switch off because my next guest is already in my, yeah. uh, my reception room. <laughs> so thank you very much and have a, have a great conference here. It was great being thank here. Thank you, thank you.